and welcome to Life Magnetics or to my YouTube, depending on where you are consuming this content. My name is Crystal Ann Compton, and I am so excited to be with you today. Um, I have a great guest. And in fact, this interview that I'm about to share with you was live streamed to YouTube a little while ago. So some of you may have caught us live, or if you're in any of my Facebook communities or on my page, you may have caught it there. But I wanted to, you know, do a little bit of editing and introduce this friend of mine properly and really set you up for what a great conversation we have. Now, before we get into the episode, I do want to remind you, please don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, follow, leave a good review because it really does help me to grow the Life Magnetics community or just helps me in the algorithm. And you know, these days it's all about the algorithm and those good reviews really help. So thank you, thank you, thank you in advance. So today you will be meeting the wonderful Harrison Ma. Now I met Harrison uh, by doing his podcast a few weeks ago and I was just kind of uh, impressed and just bowled over by what a loving being and intentional, a loving, intentional being that he is. And I'm, a, I'm quite a bit older than Harrison. And I, I hate to always focus on my age. It's not that I'm trying to make myself out to be old because you can see me if you're on YouTube. I don't look that old, but I'm just saying like, I'm always impressed. My point is I'm impressed by the younger generation that is in tuned and saying yes to the spiritual mission, their personal individual spiritual mission, and also the mission that I think we all have. That's why we came to this planet. I think we all came here to do something very, very important in our own singular way. Now, it took me 40 years it's a long time if you're a young person, 40 years to figure out what that thing was for me. And anytime I see somebody in their teens or in their 20s and even in their 30s that have locked in to that mission and who are doing the work, if you will, I don't know if work is the right word, but they're doing what they can to shine their light and offer that to other people. Like I'm just, I'm impressed. And Harrison is one of those people. And you'll see as you watch and as you listen, you can feel the frequency that he's working with. And so that's why I'm excited to share him with you. Now, Harrison has his own podcast. It's called The Cosmic Love Antenna. That's right, The Cosmic Love Antenna. And I've been listening to it for a while. It's just as juicy and intentional as his appearance on my podcast. So I do recommend that you go check it out. But I just, I feel like you're going to really resonate and calibrate to what he is offering in terms of light and knowledge. And so without further ado, let's get into today's conscious conversation with the delightful and truly lovely Harrison Ma. Hello, Harrison. How are you doing? I'm so awesome, my friend. So happy to be here. I'm so happy to have you. And I just want to say hello to everyone who will be popping on to watch. I know this is a bit of a surprise, um, but I thought I was going to have this wonderful conversation with my friend Harrison about the cosmic heart. Um, and I wanted to just share it with everybody precisely when we were having the conversation. And so hello to the Light Shine Lab. Hello to my YouTube channel. Hello to Life Magnetics. Hello to everybody who is watching. Um, let me just introduce you, if, if I can. Um, known as the Spiritual Love Coach and host of the Cosmic Love Antenna. Oh, I love that name. Harrison Ma is light and shadow integrated and personified through a life lived from the heart. He helps spiritual beings reconnect to their cosmic heart space and reclaim the remembrance of who they truly are. Welcome to the podcast, Harrison. I'm so excited that you're here. Ooh. Can't, you can't ask for more than that, right? You, like, How much more do you want than in that bio? Just, just to be fully modest, right? <laughs> I mean, I love it. And I think that on the planet right now, we are at such a critical point in our consciousness and our development. And so mm. we need folks like you who are connected and mm. tuned in 
to the possibility and to the potential. But before we get into all of that, because we're going to, I know we're going to get into it. Why don't you start off by just introducing yourself and letting us know a little bit about your background? Like, have you always mm -hmm. been a connected person? <laughs> like, who were you as a child and how did you get here? Let's, let's do that. So thank you for asking my friend. So the short answer is yes and no. And the reason I say that is, you know, in the world that I live in, I identify currently as a spiritual mentor and coach. So everything that you just read in my bio, I spend most of my time within the spiritual world. And that part of me has always been there. But to address your question directly, it wasn't always awake. And I, I grew up in Australia. I live here now still. And I grew up as a little boy in a culture, in a family, in a education system that created a being that suppressed a lot of his energy, suppressed a lot of his sensitivity, suppressed a lot of his, not just masculinity in many ways, but a lot of his femininity. So because of that upbringing, I stepped out into the world as a soul that was very unconscious. And a long story cut short, a lot of pain entered my world to help me see the thing that was not being seen internally. And, and then my awakening, I would say, began around the ages of 24, 25 and skip forward a few more years. And now I'm here. And my intention is to keep shining a light on my shadows and in that process, help other people do the same. So let's talk about your spiritual awakening, because I think that a lot of people have an idea that an awakening is like this blissful experience, right? <laughs> this, oh, oh, and the heavens parted and the angels descended. Mm. But in actuality, spiritual awakening can be jarring. It can be even painful. What was your spiritual awakening like? And when did you kind of become conscious to the fact that, whoa, I'm in a spiritual awakening? Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, it's still happening. Uh, I think that's another illusion that I'm sure you can relate to, my friend. It's not a, oh, I'm awake. It's all done. It's, it's a continual process. And so I guess when I started to tune into it, it was around that, you know, five, six years ago, but the process of it, it keeps, it keeps getting more. It keeps emphasizing. It keeps bringing me new layers and new shadows. And I think, I think where a lot of people first get stuck with it is that it's in that first piece of pain, right? Because the first piece of pain is always the hardest. And I know we spoke about this on my show with you, my friend, in, in your experience, that first, that first layer feels like the hardest because it's usually the thing we're holding on to most, right? A big part of the awakening process, in my, in my opinion, is the ego moving through death, right? The ego that we are with all of its stories and beliefs, it's dying, right? Many of those stories and many of those beliefs, they're falling away and it can feel like death in many ways. But what I've come to learn and where I'm at now is each time that ego is dying that piece of the ego is is coming back into my loving heart it gives me another opportunity to surrender and that is the muscle that builds that surrender muscle is the thing i can shine i call it through my lantern of love each time i am approached with another awakening component that brings that same pain but now i have something to address it with Mm, that's amazing. And I think that is such a good uh, perception to integrate that when something is showing itself to you, when something's kind of bubbling to the surface, if you will, whether this is something that you're conscious to or not, whether this is a past trauma or just an awareness. So many of us get so uncomfortable mm -hmm. the moment it starts to show itself. And so we run from it or we tamp it back down, right? Into the place where it was before the shadow. But we never really 
we never lean into the invitation, which is to honor and witness what is showing itself and also partner with it, bring in the light so that it can clear and or not just clear and heal, but also optimize us because everything is being offered for our betterment and our edification. And so yeah. I, I do I do want to underscore the importance of the work. That's what we're here to do. That's what refinement is. Mm. And not to run from it. And I'll just add a piece to I'll just add a piece to this. The work is is love. And what I mean by that is not just the beautiful airy fairy love, which is very much a part of that word. But it's also the because even in the words that I just expressed before around, you know, the ego dying, even that can be misconstrued as as hard and 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 sort of forceful. Where in reality, when you were just speaking about those shadows and using them and illuminating them, how are we illuminating them? We're illuminating them by holding them in our love. Right. When a I'll be very specific. A lot of the work that I do is around the inner child. And the, like I shared in my story very briefly, a lot of my conditioning and uh, shadows that led to my pain that allowed me to open up, a lot of them were seeded in childhood. So when we do inner child work, that is really what we start to do. But let's use an example. Let's say I have a rejection wound from my childhood that is coming up to be seen in one of those shadows. How do I approach that wound? Do I force it? Do I push it? Do I bare my teeth through it? That could be one way, but it's not gonna, that's not going to lead to a very nice outcome. The best way is to hold that piece inside of you like a child. How would you hold that child? You would hold it in a space of unconditional love. And that's how we approach our inner world. So in introducing you, we talked about how you help spiritual beings reconnect to their cosmic heart space. And I kind of want to go into what, what a cosmic heart mm. is. Does everybody have one? What is that? <laughs> Good question. So the short answer is yes, again. But the expanded version of that is much like my awakening. Most of us aren't attuned to it. Most of us, myself included for a long time, think the heart is just a thing in my chest that's beating and it very much is that but it is also and i'd encourage people maybe i think at the time of this release it won't be out but on my show when we had a discussion about this we talked about how the heart the cosmic heart is actually a a grid and a node for the multi-dimensional being that you are and I know your audience is probably hip to this, but for people that are maybe new to that word, what I mean by that is that the Harrison that you see now on the screen in physical form isn't just isn't just me. This isn't just the only version of me. I am I have many different facets of the love and light being that I am. Without getting too off into the weeds with that, what the cosmic heart has to do with that is that it is the portal to those different parts of me. So when I start tuning into my cosmic heart, I'm not just healing traumas and pains in my human existence. I'm actually illuminating and opening up to the bigger reality of what I am. The way it, it <laughs> sort of feels and looks for me when I, when I tap into it is that we have this heart and we can say that's an organ and it serves a function. But then there's the energetic heart, which we could say is the heart chakra, but it's like mm -hmm. so much more than something that's tethered to the body. And then there's the portal of the heart, this gateway, mm -hmm. this node that we discussed in, in your podcast, but it's also connected to other hearts. And we can say, what do you mm -hmm. think about the idea that those hearts are the portal that it connects us to our other selves in parallel universes, to other mm -hmm. beings and masters. But also I believe this heart that we have, this kingdom inside of us, as Jesus said, is connected to the heart of God, the all that is. Mm -hmm. Like we have all of that infrastructure, all of that apparatus, that functionality, that magic inside of us. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's so curious to me that so many of us don't realize the power yeah. that we have. 
I'm so excited you've opened up this part of this chat, my friend. So I'm, I'm reading a book at the moment that I think you would like. You might have read it already. It's called uh, The Third Jesus by Deepak Chopra. I mm -hmm. highly recommend you read it, my friend. I, I know you'd love it. But uh, the synopsis of the book is uh, there are three versions of Jesus, right? There is the literal man that was Jesus. There is the, the Christian uh, dogma ideology that was created around jesus and then there is the mystical consciousness that is christ consciousness and jesus and the reason i bring that up is when you speak about connecting to god through the heart i think this is a understanding that most of us don't have this is an understanding that me for example i i grew up in a christian upbringing and I thought that connecting to God was doing something external, was mm -hmm. appealing to a, as you would say, a man in a dress on a cloud on outside of me. But what I came to understand was that the only journey I had to take to connect to God was from my head to my heart. And the more time I spent in that, in that heart space, in that cosmic heart that we've been talking about the more i can start feeling that reality feeling that connection to that higher power that i am so for those out there watching and or listening who want to have that profound experience of connecting to god sounds so big and like you said so outside of us but again inside of us nonetheless how does somebody make that connection like how can somebody connect to their heart and open it up and feel that communion. Mm. So I know we'll probably speak about this later, but one, I'd highly recommend you check out my book that I'm releasing because I, yes. that is, that is the main synopsis of the book, the how, the what, the how, what, and why of this whole heart conversation. But to give some answers here and right now in this moment, the first place to begin is actually creating the time the key word there is creating right because again time isn't outside of you it is inside of you you are the creator of your reality it's starting to create the time for silence in your world again as a boy as a man growing up i spent a lot of my time in the masculine and the masculine is needed but within the masculine we often only go outside we only are in the action of the doing in the externalization. Mm -hmm. And if we're only in the masculine light and doing, we haven't created the space in our world for the feminine love, the feminine being to move through us. So just to make this super simple and practical, it can be creating time in your world where you are silent. It could be in meditation. It could be in prayer. It could be in breath work. And you allow, you start to allow the silence to come up from you. And I would add in just another tip here, add in a visualization of the heart. So what I do with the clients is before every session, I, re I really get them to bring their awareness into their heart space. It could be putting their hands on their chest. It could be feeling their heartbeat. It could be visualizing their heart field. And when you combine the silence with the visualization, that's a pretty good foundation. Hmm. And one thing I think that is interesting is that so many of the renderings and statues of antiquity, you have saints and um, other people like in prayer pose, prayer mudra, literally touching, physically mm -hmm. touching the space of the heart, which I believe is one way to send your consciousness to something. Mm -hmm. We touch it, we feel it, we know it. And so in touching the heart, you begin to actually activate this portal that we're talking about and really interacting with the heart. There was a period of time um, over the last couple of years that uh, I was having some health problems and what would happen is my heart would flutter. And one day it was racing for almost 20 minutes. And I'm like, oh, what's happening? I went and got an EKG, I'm okay. But my heart was trying to talk to me a little bit. And so what I have, what I began to do was every time it started to do that, I would just lay a hand on my heart and in a really feeling way, just say, oh, I love you so much. Mm. 
Mm. I love you so much. Thank you for all that you allow me to do. And do you know that within a second it would stop fluttering? Mm. Sometimes the body, sometimes this physical instrument that we're in just wants to talk to us, but mm -hmm. so many of us don't know how to listen and don't listen. Mm. What do you think about that? Uh, so many, so many things, my friend, but I guess the thing that rises up most in this moment is I would say it's not just the body that's speaking to us, right? We've been, we've already, you've already asked me, how do we connect to that God? How do we connect to that, to that, that deeper space? It, it is in creating space for that body to speak and the body doesn't speak just for physical challenges. Wow, I really want to make this very clear for everyone listening. A the last place a spiritual, mental, emotional challenge shows up is in the three D form. So that heart fluttering, yes, it's manifesting as a physical symptom, but I would almost with ninety nine percent clarity assume and assert that that problem wasn't the root of that problem wasn't physical. So what this means is when we allow the body to speak to us and we listen to it, that is a spiritual practice because what is behind the communication of the body? What is speaking through the body, right? Is it just the body autonomously communicating or is there something more behind it? Is there the voice of God is there the voice of the divinity that we are that is speaking through the 3D form? Right? That is, in my experience, that is the answer. Right? We, another way to describe this is in a lot of the Eastern <clears throat> uh, philosophies, traditional Chinese medicine, uh, they speak about how certain organ systems create certain emotions. I think the thing that the one that most people can understand or maybe have heard about is anger in the liver, right? We know that, that in TCM, if, if my liver is dysfunctional from a physical lens, I'm also going to have a, most likely have an imbalance in anger. So in that moment, we're creating a connection between the emotional and the physical, but I would take that deeper as an example here. What is placing the anger in the liver in the first place? Does the liver just innately hold that anger to begin with? Or again, is there a deeper force, a deeper knowing, a deeper knowledge that wishes for us to feel that emotion? Because what are emotions? They are communication. They are energy in motion. Is there a force that wants us to feel the communication of that anger? So it's placing it in the liver so we can see it. So we can what? experience it through the physical form the body is so intelligent and i love that you said that it's not just intelligent about physical matters and a lot of the work that i've been doing some of the channeling that's coming through spirit is actually setting up my perception of the body as the hall of records the Akashic in 3D of me mm -hmm. and anything that I wish to reference, understand any way that I wish to connect to that, which is not outside of me, but you know what I mean, to, to yeah. connect to whatever grid of consciousness exists inside of me, which makes me so curious about what's happening on the planet right now, Harrison, because there is also this push from the Maya, the matrix, if you will, to disassociate from the body. Yeah. And to disregard and to project the body or the self as something that it isn't because we want to project ourselves as what is standardly yeah. beautiful or accepted. And so there's this strange paradox that's happening right now where it seems like the world says, you aren't your body. Your body is nothing. But spirit is really communicating right now. Your body is a temple and yeah. it's coded with the essence of the soul. So yeah. important. Yeah. Crystal, my friend, I just, I enjoy you as a soul and I really am enjoying this conversation. I can't, I, I can't have this conversation with many people. So I just want to say, I appreciate Me neither. you. Um, Indeed. I think you're spot on with everything that you're saying. I think I'll give another example here 
I would say this, and this is this isn't just a new thing. This disassociation between the body and our spirit, and the and the and the agenda behind it. Look at again, and I, I never want to cast a light on all aspects of religion being bad. I think there are beautiful mystical foundations of all of the world religions, but unfortunately, within the within the example of Christianity, that that shame and blame and persecution of the physical body has been happening for centuries, right? Has been has been there for such a long time. So I think if one was a conspiracy theorist, and I try not to be, but I have an open mind and I take in all perspectives, a cons a conspiratorial perspective of this is that it is very much that way to disconnect us from our power, right? There is so much blame and shame, and this this force to to disassociate from the body, like you said, because in that act we are cutting the cord between us and the power that we are, right? Because as we just have already said in this conversation, the body speaks, the body keeps score, the, the, our issues are in our tissues. And when we, uh, when we allow ourselves to see that, we take our power back. We, we, we take our power back and, and this is what goes against all the systems at play, we start to realize that the systems at play are secondary that the the doctors the 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 big food systems the you know the information technology they are not our power they are they are secondary to the power that's inside of us indeed in fact they are meant to be tools and the tool serves the master the master does not serve the tool but we've got it a little bit inverted at this time and i I wonder what your thoughts are because you, you, in describing yourself, talked about the systems of childhood that you were in that found you um, muting your masculinity, muting your femininity. But here on the planet, there is such an emergence of redefining what these things are yeah. and the casting off of old ways and traditional ideas about what that means. And of course, there's always a spectrum when this happens. There's a chaotic version of what might be happening there. But there's also, I feel, a strong spiritual impulse that's that's making itself manifest right now mm -hmm. and i think the invitation is to allow it to flow and where we get stuck is by saying well it needs to look like this masculinity needs to look like this femininity needs to look like this can you speak a little bit about your perception of divine masculine divine feminine and how a person can allow that to express itself through themselves that's a big one, but if you can. <laughs> oh no, I love it because it's my soul just had a little backflip because it's it's probably the most important question you could ask me right now because this is I've really started to in my current journey in this moment in time. This is something I'm I'm redefining once again. So I'm so happy that you asked it. So what it looks like, I'm sure people in your audience have heard the term twin flame. And for such a long time, for me, I had the limiting belief that the twin flame was something outside of me. A twin flame was a, a fated soul contract that, that was just waiting, in the, waiting in, the, in the ether to drop down. But in reality, what your twin flame actually is, is the heart of God that is you, the heart, the cosmic heart, if we want to use my, my, my terminology cosmic heart that is you that is god and the twin flame is is the divine balance between your divine masculine and your divine feminine mm. or another way to describe this mm. is the masculine is the light and the feminine is the love right you are a being of light and love you are a being of divine masculine and divine feminine right this is you and this to use more religious uh terminology here with a mystical foundation this is the real holy trinity right the holy trinity is the divine masculine the divine feminine coming together to make god's heart which is you so going back to your question how do we embody find balance you know how do i move through this well it's it's on a day-to-day -day basis it's constantly asking where am I producing too much light? Meaning, 
where am I too much in the masculine and I need to step back and fall back into the love of the feminine. I would, I would, I would call the feminine, the, the voidal, the voidal space inside of you that we can all fall back to that space where we don't need to do anything. We just need to be held and received and be in that creative flow. But then the opposite side of that is, okay, I can't be in that all the time because if I'm in that creative flow all the time, then nothing is being transferred into light and action. So for me, just to summarize this, it's constantly checking in with myself. Am I too much in the light or am I too much in the love? Is there a perfect balance of this or is this something that we always have to strive to achieve or is there a way to just be in the balance of this? Yeah, well, I think when we are in the balance, that's what it means to be in the flow, right? When you, mm. we all know what this feels like, right? When you are, uh, when you have that balance of love and light, things are manifesting for you. Things are just, are just moving. You're just, everything is just, I, I, the thing that the image that comes into my, into my third eye in this moment is it's, it's flowing down the stream of life. And instead of hitting all the rapids because you're, you're unbalanced, you're sort of, you're intuitively moving and taking action and tuning into the creation as you go. So something that we, a fine line that we don't always walk, but when we do walk it, we know what it feels like. Do you think it's possible to walk that line with a nine to five, three kids got to get them to soccer practice? Is that achievable? Do you think? Mm -hmm. I want to say yes, <laughs> but a big part of me, but a big part of me says no, because the nine to five is another system. And what I mean by that is, this is not to say that people that are currently in that system are flawed. This is never about the individuals. This is about the systems that we're in and we constantly have to assess, is that system serving us? And I know just by looking at my life, when I have lived in that nine to five system, when I look at my friends, my family members that live in that nine to five system, I, I connect back to that balance that we we're just talking about. And I very rarely see them in that. I very mm. rarely see them in that balance because that nine to five system has some innate flaws in it, right? One, it, it's projecting an identity of value outside of us, right? This is a nine to five. I wait till the weekend. I get to the weekend. I take a break and then I go again. And if I'm not in this system, then I'm not doing the thing. I'm not valuable. I'm not worthy. When in reality, none of that was outside of you to begin with. All of it was inside of you. So to summarize that again, I think it's accessible, but I think most of us within that system are getting take away, taken away by its identity rather than feeling our innate worth. Mm. Profound. Um, you know, you take the example of Jesus, who, according to religion, and you can, you know, feel whatever you want to feel about that, according to religious, was God in the form of man, in the system of man, in humanity, but embodied. And I don't know if Christ was activated on his 30th birthday or whether he was activated the entire time, <laughs> right? Well, he was taking him to school when he was 13 years old. He was taking the priest to oh, school. Yeah. But um he is an example of being in the muggle or mundane world, the systems and dealing with the systems all the time, mm -hmm. so much so that he got angry about it, right? Throwing over tables and yet was embodied divine. But then again, he, he was an avatar and he was able to strike that balance. Um, we're in it thick here, especially right now at this time in earth's history, this is thick what we are in. Mm -hmm. I believe that we chose now, we chose incarnation, we chose earth. And as a soul, we said, I want to, I want to get in there, tag me in. Do you think that, what do you think of those that have incarnated now? Are we supposed to be doing something in particular? Do you think? <laughs> what, a, what a beautiful question. So again, I'm going to give the short answer and the long answer. The short answer is 
we don't have to do anything right this mm-hmm. one of our most divine gifts is free will and i think that's why we have multiple lives to begin with and karma right it's it's to again release that limiting belief that there's something outside of us that is judging us there's nothing judging you there's just your choices that you make and then the karma you create from those choices balanced or unbalanced energy so full stop however to say that like you have alluded to a few times in this conversation that right now in this in our current timeline and in and cyclical nature of this pattern that we're on that things aren't happening that that there isn't a need for more awakenings to occur i think to not say that would be a delusion so i think that as a individual node of the collective that we are right the the individual soul expression of the oneness that we are each individual soul has the mission to ascend right we are given free will we don't have to ascend but there is always an optimal choice within in, in any given situation to ascend but we have to understand that ascension isn't a singular game it is a group game mm-hmm. i ascend only if crystal ascends we all ascend together so in the context of this current era that we're in i feel that the the necessity to ascend has never been higher because of you know this might be a whole other conversation but because of what the soul of the earth is going through she is a soul that's going through her own ascension process and where she is at currently there is a need for us to be with her to connect to her to open up to her and then simultaneously at the same time that that's going on there is also this very heavy human shadow collective human shadow that is coming to the surface right the last 2 3 years of events is evident of that so with the combination of where the earth is at and where our collective shadow is currently at i do think i agree with you that souls are both incarnating and coming in with a heightened if you want to call it loving pressure or push to move towards the love and light to move towards the choices that we individually make that are for love rather than for suppression shadow and darkness mm. i love the the visual of collective human shadow that which we have been unconscious to rising to the surface now reframing the chaos that's being projected to us as opportunity to heal it it's only mm-hmm. rising because it can be healed right and it only it only rises because we can witness it and clear it um and that time i do believe is now you know edgar casey talked about uh the turn of the century around the year 2000 that there would be many many souls that would be incarnating that had been alive in atlantis and many mm-hmm. people say and i think um edgar casey agreed in his in his speakings which are recorded that the atlanteans had a lot of the same kind of yeah. technology and a lot of the same kind of issues that we are currently facing and so i think it's interesting that a lot of us are atlanteans coming yeah. back now to redo the game if yeah. we can do you think 100, we can 100 <laughs> ooh it's a good question let me hit on the atlantean face first cuz i can't yes, you can't okay. just drop you can't just drop the atlantean and come out and us to brush brush past it <laughs> this is why i said within the timeline time is not linear it's cyclical right so i could not agree more with you that everything we're going through right now we've not just been through before but within the context of atlantis it's very similar if not the same in re- to answer your question though can we can we break through the cycle can we can we do something different this time the answer to that is going back into that cosmic heart space and when i tune into my heart and when i just when i start to see the examples of people like you my friend and all the people that i've had on my show just in my little world 
there are so many little microcosms of the macrocosms that are so bright right now, right? It's so easy. I'll just give an example. It's so easy for me to turn on the news, which I I don't do anymore. I've stopped doing that, you know, multiple years ago now. But when it does come into my world, when I go to a family member's house and I see it playing in the background, it would be so easy for me to, through the lens of the news, see the world as only darkness, see the world as, oh, of course, we're just going to go through the same fall of Atlantis again, because from what that system is showing me, it's all darkness right now. There's no light. But is that the greater reality? From what I see on a day-to-day basis, I would say no, right? From all the light and all the love and all the awakening beings, I personally believe there's never been more of a mass illumination yes using the atlantis example i think there were also a large group of awakening but at that time we didn't have the internet at that time we didn't have all of this technology which is a tool right it's not its own entity it's a tool that we we had the opportunity to channel our love through we didn't have this ubiquitous technology that we could have these conversations so i think it is the same but at the same time I think the opportunity and the potential is different. I don't know, Harrison. I wonder if they did have their version of the internet. And I wonder if that's what the biblical story of the (laughs) tower. We're going to have to. The biblical story of the Tower of Babel, like humans just get more and more and more intelligent. So God has to scatter them and start over again. And they got to start at the lowest rung. But I mean, um, who knows, but it does kind of feel like the echo of in my humanity says to me, we've done this before. We're here to do it again, but we've been fine tuned differently. We have um, different abilities, different connections that are optimized this time. Um, And, you know, but I I still think it's, it's, when you look forward, um, I'm a clairvoyant and um, I deal with timelines both back and front. And when you look forward, those timelines are switching. They're all, they're like really, really switching a lot based on where we are as a collective. So I'm definitely hopeful and I definitely think we can. It's just, will we? I don't know, but that's okay. (laughs) So. Let me just add a piece to this because you said abilities and you you just, you again, you dropped clairvoyance and mm-hmm. the clair senses. I, I think that that's a big differentiating factor that is going to sway us one way or, or one way or the other going forward, right? And when you said, did we have those technologies in the past? That's what came up in me. I think it, depending on who you look mm-hmm. at, the Edgar Casey, the, I, a lot of my, Atlantis understanding comes from Dolores Cannon's work, depending on who you look at, right? That many, many would say that at the time of Atlantis, there was more a a larger mass of people that were open to these different abilities and, and those abilities allowed them to do very special and magnificent things. So if you, if you take that and look at now, I would say it's a very different reality. Now I'd say there's far less, if not very minimal amount of people that have woken up to those abilities. And when I project into the future and which timeline we will end up falling into, I think that's one of the differentiating Mm. factors. If there is a, a mass, not just awakening, but a mass awakening to the powers that we have, right? Because you just, you use, let's use the example of clairvoyance. 99% of people, don't even know what that means, let alone have an embodied experience of it. So, you know, stepping forward, if people start to awaken up to these abilities, I think that is really going to shift a lot of things. Yes, absolutely. A lot of the teaching that I've done has been around the intuitive arts, primarily to wake people up to the reality that your intuition is entirely natural. It's entirely human. It's entirely yours. It always has been. But you really do have to become aware of it in order to activate it. But we all do have it. Um, in deference to time, because I feel like I could talk to you for so long. <laughs> but in deference to time, I, I do understand, based on our previous conversations, that you are an initiate in a mystery school. Mm-hmm. 
which um, I don't know whether I can ask about because it's mysterious, but can you tell us about the process of being drawn to that and, and what's currently happening in your life because of that? Yeah, thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can, it's, uh, Mystery School is just a, a nice little title you can add to it, but it's, um, I'm being trained under the Ishtar Master Channel group. Ishtar is a, uh, she's a, an embodied descended master channel and she's 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 brought in a lot of teachings from a group of 33 ascended masters that are helping the collective in many ways and so without going too deeper into that how it's impacting my life at the moment is it's really allowed me and continues to allow me to go deeper into what it means to be a divine channel what does that mm -hmm. what does that actually mean and for myself and for I'm sure a lot of people listening, when you hear the word channel, we can think that much like you were just alluding to with the word intuition, that only certain people can channel. When in reality, we are all divine channels. Most of us, well not, well, not most of us, all of us are channeling all the time, but most of us are channeling our shadows. Most of us are channeling our traumas, our pain, our inner child wounds, our ancestral wounds, our the the belief systems that we've been brought up in, etc. When we can understand that, we can then ask the next question, okay, if that's if that's the unhealthy side of channeling, what is the more natural, divine way of channeling? And the answer to that question has really been what I've been doing and within the within the school itself and how I've been adding this into my whole uh, a conversation around what the cosmic heart is because the cosmic heart is is the portal for which our channel expresses itself right to be a channel in many ways is not just learning to channel outside things so such as you know outside angels ancestors guides etc that's one way of channeling but the deepest way of channeling is learning to channel the different parts of your being so we talked about how we are a multidimensional being at the start of this conversation. When I decide to channel, I'm actually tapping into different parts of myself. So an example of that would be, I decide to channel my higher self, or I decide to channel my divine presence. And my divine presence is the, the deepest part of me that's connected to, to God, right? So to land here, this has really started to fold and express itself into all areas of my life, especially when I show up for others to help them heal. Yes. And I, I can see this. And as we've been talking, I've actually seen you on a stage actually. And I don't know if that's appealing mm. to you at all, but like on a stage in front of a lot of people um, <laughs> channeling, but also there it's the, it's the it's the channeling but it's the dispensation of energy that happens when you channel become the vessel and like th how that recalibrates people in your space whether you say something or not it's really just that you are holding it and expressing it so i see this in you very much <laughs> holding holding the frequency and giving the frequency dispensing that to to others as well the um key I word, definitely... the key mm -hmm. word there is frequency and uh, crystal i just want to say thank you for that sharing that image because uh, uh, you're not the only one that's had that image. I keep, that's a, that's a, one of the mm -hmm. images that keeps channeling through me. I keep seeing it. So thank you for affirming that. Um, yes. I just want to hit on what you said there with frequency because that's mm -hmm. so important for people to hear. When I say love frequency from the cosmic heart, that is the, the thing, the biggest thing that we can channel right? It's words, body movements, uh, writing, singing. These are all secondary gifts that we can add on to the foundation that is the innate love frequency that we can express, right? We, uh, as an example of this, right? When you have a conversation with someone, especially if it's a very deep heartfelt conversation, the silence between the words has just as much impact and sensation 
as the words themselves. And that is an example of what you're saying. When we are very intentional with what we're channeling, we can learn to give us just give just as much value within the silence because the frequency is in both the silence and the words themselves. Yes. Well said. Um, you know, and St. Francis said, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Just make me the vessel, the thing that holds the light because the light knows how to do what the light knows how to do. I just have to, I, my practice is embodiment and allowing the flow of that. And then if I can do that at the maximum level, everybody's getting healed today. Everybody's mm -hmm. getting the message today. Everybody's getting the energy today, right? And so I just, I feel like innately um, you have that, the connection and the instrumentation to do that. So in the work that you do with clients, let me mm -hmm. ask you, do you, what kind, so if somebody comes to you, are they coming for a reading? Or are they coming from this disp for this dispensation? What, what are your services like? <laughs> I love that word, dispensation. Yes. I think it's a beautiful uh, image for it. So I, the label and the system that I, I share my work under would be under coaching slash mentoring slash counseling. So within that box, that is how I share my gifts, my channel, my frequency. So what that looks like in a very 3D practical understanding just for people is I go deep. It's not just so that I have nothing against readings. I, I do readings myself. I think they're valuable. But if we're looking for long-term change, especially if we want to get to the deep, deepness of the troubles that people have. And when people come to see me, the troubles that they have, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say it this way. They're not, they're not surface level. They're, they're very deep from, you know, inner child wounds, abuse, ancestral, religious, et cetera. So with that understanding, I'm of the belief that those challenges are not a one and done, one session, have a card, you're good, goodbye. It takes time, right? Which is why I coach, mentor, cancel people in containers of one month, three months. I have a client now that I've been I'm with for a year, right? It depends on what your goal is, what your intention is, what you're looking to heal. Even more practically, what that looks like is within each session, there is a cosmic dance that you've experienced, my friend, being on this my podcast. And there is a, a deep sort of, I'm giving guidance. People are sharing from their heart what they're going through. And then I'm with my knowledge, with my wisdom and understanding, and also my divine channel sharing and giving tools and practices to help them through that. But then the other side of my sessions, which are, is more with the channeling, I also guide and help souls journey into themselves. And mm -hmm. this is usually done in a guided meditation activation where I'm channeling my divine presence and helping them connect into their divine presence to reveal and illuminate the answers that they're looking for. Do you do any of this work in a group setting? Because I can just imagine being on a Zoom <laughs> with a bunch of other people, like just in the presence of that. Do you do workshops or anything like that? Um, not at the moment. Come I'm, on now. I've I've tried it. I've tried in the past. I've did a, I did one cycle of it for about two months, I think it was, and it worked beautifully. But at the moment, it's on pause because I'm still I'm still working out the logistics of that. So sure, sure. Apparently, no, but probably in the future, yes. Okay, so if someone wanted to connect with you and check out the work that you do, where would they go? Mm -hmm. How would they do that? Yeah. So, best way is my website, harrisonmar.com. Ma spelled M-E-A-G-H-E-R, and that's to sort of have a surface level understanding of what I do, but I would say the best way to really tune into my frequency and what I'm mm -hmm. about is either on my podcast, your, mm -hmm. the cosmic love antenna <laughs> and, and, or on my social feeds. I'm quite active on Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn and TikTok, And it's, I, I'm submitting daily content 
on guidance and sharing channels of wisdom where people can connect. And that's awesome. ha mm -hmm. at Harrison Ma, my username. Okay, now put the links to all of that in the description of this podcast and also in the description of this video. So Cosmic Love Antenna is a podcast, which I've listened to. And truly, 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 I recommend that everybody go out and just a, a dose, whether it's just you yourself. And I love all of your guests, but I love it too when you do a solo episode because you can just really get the frequency that we're talking about. But definitely check out Harrison's podcast. But don't you also have a book by the same name coming out? When's that coming Correct. out? Correct. Thank you for asking, my friend. So it is currently in pre-order at the time of doing this live and mm -hmm. recording. Um, but depending on the release, it might be out already. So I'm aiming to have it out by the end of the month. So we're in February at the moment, so end of month. Uh, and you can either pre-order it now at the, the cosmicloveantenna.com, cosmicloveantenna.com. And if you pre-order it now, another special gift connected to what we've been talking about today, if you go to the website, put in your email, pre-order it. I am giving everyone some extra gifts and those gifts I'm actually going to be doing this week. I am channeling some extra meditations and some mm -hmm. tools that you can use on the journey back into your cosmic heart. The cosmic, I'm going to go the cosmic love antenna.com. That's where we pre-order and get some of these gifts. Okay. Awesome. Correct. I'll put the link Correct. to that in the description and we'll make sure that this, um, this episode in terms of the podcast gets out by the end of this month. So everybody can go <clears throat> and get the book and I will get a book. I'll get a copy of the book for you'll love, you'll love it. My friend, you'll I know it. I will. So I have to ask you because and this will be my final question. I promise. But like, are you the cosmic love antenna? Are we all cosmic love yeah. antennas? What tell us, what yeah. does this mean? How did you come up with that? Uh, Crystal, just for time, I'm good for time. So you, I'm, okay. I'm in your container. You do whatever you need to do. Um, yeah. So that, that image, the cosmic love antenna, is is all of us. And put simply, what it means is like an antenna system, there are two main parts, right? There is the inner frequency of love that we've been talking about a lot, all that connects into that cosmic heart that we're made of, this, the divinity, the spirit, the godliness, whatever you want to call it, is inside of us, the frequency. But then we also have the outside structure, which is what? Which is the physical 3D form that we've also talked about today. And both are equal. Both are equal in their necessity in order to share our love frequency with the world. So the love, the cosmic love antenna is not just what we are, but it is a, an important understanding of the divine balance that we need to have between the non-physical and the physical of what makes us truly beautiful. Hmm. I love that. Um, and when I when I saw the name of your podcast, I'm like, I've got to talk to this person. <laughs> and I'm just I just have to say um, that I'm so pleased to have met you. And I do believe the world needs more open hearted people who are leaning into the process of life and willing to look at themselves as they are and what they carry and to become conscious to this and then to like, as we talked about, become the instrument and let that light shine. That's what Jesus said when he said, don't hide it under a bushel. you got to let that light mm -hmm. shine. And so I just want to honor the work that you do um, through the book, through the podcast, through this appearance, through, through what you do with people, because you're an incredibly high frequency person. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being on the podcast, but really thank you for allowing me to meet you and have conversations with you. Again, I feel like we could be here for hours talking about the most esoteric things, but um, I just really appreciate what you bring. And I wanted to thank you. Harrison. Well, Crystal, love received and I receive it all, but I I'm going to boomerang it back at you. Right. And this is, and this is something that I speak about in my book a lot. And I know, you know, this, but I share this for, for everyone else's understanding. The love is a two way channel, right? And I'll, I'll share this crystal because this is a very important understanding that I think most of us don't have the, the love that you feel coming off me, right? The extent in which you feel that is the extent in which that that same love has opened inside of you. Well, another way to say it is, what does it mean to resonate with someone? 
does it mean that person is giving me something and I'm feeling all lovely? Or does it mean what is in them is in me, mm-hmm. right? What, what they are is also me. Right? I, I, I have a lot of people that tell me all the time, not just what you said, but that I'm so in love with you when I'm around you. I feel so much, I feel my, so much love for you. And it's easy within that dynamic to think again that I am giving you something. Mm-hmm. And yes, I'm not, I'm never, I never want to underestimate the work that I've done on myself and the ability I have to open my channel and do all the things. Yes. But love is a two way channel. And for you to even feel that is the degree in which you've done that same work or there is a loving push currently inside of you to do that work, to open up because that which feels is that which is inside of you too. Mm. Hearkening back to Neville Goddard, who said, everything is just you pushed out. Yeah. I love you that. are me and you've come to show me me. So thank you. I'm beautiful. <laughs> thank you. I'm in love with me. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Oh, Harrison, thank you so much for being a guest on my podcast and to many happy returns. May we stay connected and I will be supporting your work and I love you.